I have to admit that it feels like things have definitely been slow, or maybe just somewhat quiet in the gaming space to start off 2020, at least compared to last year in which there was just some shocking huge gaming announcements and a few massive releases by now, but things of course will begin to heat up as 2020 will be a monumental year in gaming, with the launch of the next generation of consoles and the release of giant blockbuster titles that include Cyberpunk 2077 and The Last of Us Part 2. But even even right now, on a more positive note in this gaming space, Animal Crossing New Horizons just looks amazing. The Final Fantasy VII Remake demo was a pleasant surprise, releasing at 3am Eastern Standard Time a few nights ago, and I thought it was pretty fun and extremely gorgeous, the graphics just are phenomenal. Additionally, a game I've been waiting for years, Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is finally approaching a release of sorts. And just today, Ghost of Tsushima, one of my most anticipated games of 2020, got a release date of June 2020. 20, so it's actually only a number of months away, which is exciting. So certainly there are at least for myself some aspects of gaming that have me happy right now. But of course, then we have the usual suspects of this AAA games industry, which are just very good about stirring up some chaos. And today we once again discuss some of that, which includes Bethesda making crystal clear that they just do not understand their audience, Electronic Arts being laughed at for technical issues, which caused an official FIFA 2020 esports match to be played with a game of rock, paper, scissors instead of, you know, the actual game, and Activision's trouble continues as a studio lead abandoned ship. Additionally, we have CDPR doing yet another pro-consumer action, which has actually made some developers angry, Ubisoft and Bioware disappointing their live service audiences, and a lot more. But as usual, if you do go on to enjoy this content and want to show your support for gaming coverage like this, please consider hitting that like button, subscribing for more, and turning notifications notifications on so you do not miss out on any new videos. Nonetheless, in a quick rundown of some of the other smaller stories happening in gaming that I want to quickly cover, Ubisoft's Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which is the equivalent of overpriced horse manure, will continue being just that, possibly for a bit longer. In this games industry, there's a common belief that all of these live services will eventually enjoy bright and glorious futures, but that simply is, it's a myth. Breakpoint was one of the worst games of 2019, plagued by numerous technical and performance issues, alongside a bunch of mediocre content in a boring, vast open world that was made far worse when it was clear that Ubisoft spent more time working on the game's greedy in-game store than the actual experience. Now, as I mentioned before, some have stuck with this game, believing that it has a bright future ahead. Well, unfortunately, Ubisoft has disappointed those fans with an announcement in which the developer says it was was pushing back the introduction of a new immersive mode and engineer class to sometime this spring. And they also clarified saying that they promised to be more forthcoming with communication because, again, like numerous live services, Ubisoft has not been very good with communication and transparency with uh, fans. But yeah, unfortunately, Ubisoft these last number of months have been very good with disappointment. And it goes beyond just Ghost Recon Breakpoint because we look at Prince of Persia, many were upset with the uh, reintroduction of the franchise in the form of a VR escape game. And then there's also been recent news that there is no work or any development currently on a Splinter Cell game, something that many have been awaiting for years, but Ubisoft right now at least has no plans of continuing that. But on the bright side, if there is any, I guess, the Division 2 has gotten a recent expansion, which as far as I've seen, it's been well received. Speaking of disappointing live services, Anthem actually recently celebrated its one year anniversary, and again, just like Ghost Recon Breakpoint, a lot of people have stuck with this game, and those who have stuck with this game were hoping for some meaningful content to celebrate the one year anniversary, and unfortunately, the way that Bioware celebrated the game's anniversary was with the release, or it was an exclusive gift of vinyls, or pretty much, I guess you could say, stickers. Um, yeah, that just kind of defines what Anthem has been, but hey, maybe in the coming months or year we'll see what Anthem 2.0 looks like, but for now, it's just, it's been rough. It's been rough for Bioware and it's been rough for Anthem. Moving along, in the Wall Street world, some are very interested and some are very worried about Tencent or Riot Games' upcoming shooter, which is called Valorant. And from the footage that has been released of it, it essentially looks like Counter-Strike with abilities. And some believe that this could 
really hurt or financially hurt Activision Blizzard's Overwatch. So I think that's going to be interesting to see what Valorant turns into. Some believe it's going to be the esports juggernaut of the future, so we'll have to see. But yeah, Activision Blizzard certainly does have some competition, although I definitely do think that this would be more competition for Valve, but hey, that's just me. And in some other greedy news, I just wanted to talk about this very briefly. Dead or Alive 6 has a hair color change microtransaction, which is a complete slap in the face. And I mean, this is the most AAA thing I've seen all day. I'm not very familiar with the Dead or Alive franchise, but every time it pops up in the news, it seems to be of some type of greedy, nonsensical decision that's coming from the publisher, and this is the latest one. But in all honesty, this seems like something that you'd see from Electronic Arts or Take-Two Interactive with their sports franchises, so not too surprising, but yeah, this greed is something, it's common in this industry, and it should be called out whenever it's happening, and Dead or Alive 6, my god, I, I don't know why, but every time I hear about this game, it's never anything positive, it's always about the greed. Now, we finally move on to our first main topic of the day, and that is Bethesda, and we're starting with their infamous live service train wreck or disaster, and that is Fallout 76. As I've documented, for the last year or two, it's just been debacle after debacle with this game. Currently, Fallout 76 is still under attack by the same individual that has been wreaking havoc for months, and that is Erect Ban, who just the other day teased his latest hack, which has tons of loot, including rare items just dropping from the sky above. It's like cloudy with a chance of meatballs, but in video game form, I, I guess. These hacks have tarnished the economy of Fallout 76, and Bethesda just has not been able to stop it. At best, they wrote in a recent Q&A post that they take exploits and cheating seriously, and have shown that by implementing a feature that allows them to put forward hotfixes without having to take servers down, so the bare minimum. And that's the problem. Bethesda cannot stop these hacks, which have consistently devastated this live service since launch. And a lot of people have not understood, or, well, it's just become nonsensical, a lot of the decision-making happening behind the scenes over at Bethesda. And I'm not talking just Bethesda Game Studios, I'm talking publisher Bethesda, and even beyond that with ZeniMax. Just a lot of greedy, nonsensical decisions coming from this company, and it's not exclusive to Fallout 76, as we've seen with other games like Wolfenstein Young Blood, the Wolfenstein VR Cyberpilot, which almost everybody hated, then we also have the Elder Scrolls Blades, it's a company-wide problem. Now, recently, Bethesda's Pete Hines, he's one of the heads of the company for marketing, he talked about Fallout 76, and it just proves that this company does not understand their audience at all. And I wanted to go over some of the comments that he made, specifically about what he had to say about PvP. And this is an interview coming via US Gamer who spoke again to Bethesda's Vice President of Global Marketing and Communications, Pete Hines, and he admitted that they misunderstood their audience, saying, well, I mean, at the end of the day, our intention was always, we're going to put this out there, see what folks think, and then cater the stuff that we do later to their reaction. So, for example, I think we were a little surprised how few people wanted to take part in PvP, and how many more they were interested in PvE together, as opposed to, I want to test my metal against you, and let's get into a duel. There's some folks who do, don't get me wrong, but I think it's a smaller percentage of our player base than we thought. And this really just, this defines the whole Fallout 76 experience. Bethesda just does not know 100% what they're doing. Now, it does seem like they're starting to understand what Fallout 76 needs to be, and it needs to be focused on story. That's evident with the Wastelanders expansion, which introduces human NPCs. And from the footage that has been shown, it looks fine. And I do think Fallout 76 is going to be heading in a, a road that a lot of people will like. It's heading into, let's make Fallout 76 Fallout 4 with co-op, which is exactly what it should have been at release. But I really do think Bethesda wanted this whole live service. They wanted to jump on that bandwagon and not have to spend as much money or resources on story content. And PvP, I'm going to admit, it's cheaper. So that's what Bethesda wanted to do, and they misunderstood the interest in the Fallout franchise, because those sales, they weren't as big as Fallout 4 or Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 3 at all. They were a lot lower. 
And because of that, they're finally realizing if they want this to be a live service that exists for years to come, they have to invest the resources. They have to invest the time. And honestly, it may be too little too late because I don't know if people will return. But I do have to say, if this does start to turn into, say, a Fallout 4 with co-op, I do think it's going to bring players back. And then you'll start hearing people saying Bethesda's making one of the biggest gaming comebacks ever. And oh boy, that'll be interesting when we see that, if it does come to that. But so far, Wastelanders does look good, and Bethesda's, I guess they're finally admitting that they were wrong, although I think all of us, even before release, could have said that the, the way that they were going with Fallout 76 was just, it didn't make any sense, and it was always doomed to fail, although Bethesda certainly did a great job at blowing those expectations up, and obviously not positively. Right now, many gaming outlets are rightfully pointing out that Fallout 76 is becoming, or it's starting to focus on the story or single player aspect, which is exactly what Fallout 76 should have been from the get-go. The Wastelanders update represents a relaunch for this game. If it's even decent in quality, it will win people back, especially because the price tag is currently just a few dollars. Now, what can get in the way of that is all of the chaos, greed, and exploits which have plagued this game since day one. Many, including myself, are skeptical that Wastelanders will launch without something breaking. So Fallout 76 was always intended to be a live service that lasted for years to come until eventually Fallout 5 comes to be, and that's still probably about seven years away. Bethesda now, if you do want 76 to have a future, they have to invest the resources and time into the aspects that people actually like, which is the story. Basically turning this into Fallout with co-op, which should have been the day one focus, but I personally don't fully believe the incompetence card that Bethesda is attempting to pull. What I actually think is the case is that they just got lazy, believe that the Fallout brand would sell no matter what. It would sell itself. And unfortunately, that did not happen, so here they are now, forced to do what they should have always done. But there are many questions that remain, like how will they monetize this experience moving forward? Because I do not believe for a second that Bethesda will be complicit or okay with their current in-game store, the utility items, and their Fallout First subscription service. Essentially, there's many ways that this could go horribly wrong once again for Bethesda. And for now, I'm just on the, we'll have to wait and see what happens, because Fallout 76 has certainly surprised me for all of the wrong reasons since it launched all the way back in November of 2018. But next, I quickly want to go over a recent advertisement for Bethesda's upcoming Doom Eternal, obviously developed by id Software. But a lot of people have been trashing, mocking, and roasting Bethesda for this, again citing that this company clearly does not understand their audience, but I personally have a more mixed reaction to this and I quickly wanted to go over what exactly is happening. And I can't play this advertisement for obvious reason, copyright with music, but basically what's happening is that Doom has a new advertisement which is airing all over the world. I actually already heard it on SoundCloud when I was playing some music, and it's rap music over Doom gameplay, and people feel that it does not match at all, and they cite Doom 2016, which had a very heavy focus on metal music. And as you can see on Bethesda's uh, YouTube link or their page for this, it's being, it's been dislike bombed. Over 54,000 dislikes, and some of the top comments include, what's Doom famous for? Uh, it's gameplay and music? Cool, let's show neither in the trailer. Bethesda, rap music in a trailer for Doom? Internet, rip and tear until it is done. Error number one, never try using rap in a trailer that is supposed to belong to the heavy metal genre. Doom Eternal, Hood Slayer, but seriously, you have effing Mick Gordon, and this is what you come up with? Even worse than the Mortal Kombat 11 trailer, the Slayer doesn't need courage, he is not afraid of anything. Fire the whole marketing department. Y'all got Mick Gordon harvesting the souls of innocence to use in the, this game's soundtrack, and this is the music you went with? They should probably fire the guy who was making decisions here, and these comments go on and on, but you kind of get the gist. So I think most of you watching this kind of understand what Bethesda was thinking. Reach out to the normal casual audience with a trailer with rap music because rap music is pretty darn, it's marketable. And that's what a lot of people listen to nowadays. Myself, personally, I'll be listening from Slipknot to uh, 
Roddy Rich. I listened to pretty much everything. So when I saw this trailer, it didn't really do anything for me at all. I thought it was kind of odd, basically because I didn't think the rap music was very good or fitting at all, but I don't really think that it's such a big deal just because I understand what Bethesda's marketing team is trying to do. They're trying to reach a casual audience, but can understand the opposing point of view, which is that this is not representative of the actual experience. And this is actually something that exclusively games pointed out. If I were someone who never played Doom before, I'd sit here and wonder, what is this generic action game with unfitting music? Because that's what the trailer shows us and tells us. It's a run-of-the-mill and safe commercial, and without showing off the heart and soul of Doom, well, you see the result. The minds who made this commercial somehow managed to take everything Doom out of a trailer for Doom Eternal. How do you do that? How does this pass a quality test? Did they even consider at least an in-house showing of this to see what the general feedback was? Right now, the TV spot has over 44,000 dislikes, much more now, against only 5.6 thousand likes. That's scathing feedback. So to wrap up my thoughts, this is Bethesda's marketing team believing rap music and not metal music can sell this game to the so-called normies. And I know there are a lot of opinions on that, judging by the reaction to this TV spot on YouTube, which includes thousands of comments just roasting Bethesda. But finally, let's move to everyone's favorite publisher, Electronic Arts, which for the last number of weeks have been dealing with tons of outages for all of their online games, which has angered many fans. The reasons for these server outages are unknown, but the problem became just a little bit bigger at a recent FIFA 20 esports event, which resulted in two competitors battling it out with a game of rock, paper, scissors. True story, as Ars Technica writes, I cannot believe it, FIFA pro Sean Brancha56 Galea tweeted, we literally had to play rock, paper, scissors because we couldn't find each other to invite in an EA license qualifier. WTF I am done. All that hard work from phase one for absolutely nothing. Galea added in a follow up tweet which has since been deleted. Phase two comes and I lose a rock paper scissors game to decide my Swiss record. What else can I say my head's completely gone. Galea's competition Hassan Husu 19 Ecker confirmed in his own tweet translated from German that he advanced to a three to one record in the round because I was able to successfully prevail in rock paper scissors. Furthermore, EA would follow up with a statement in response to what it called a really unique situation, noting that the competitors decided to proactively play rock, paper, scissors to determine the match winner after they were unable to connect for their match. And for what it's worth, these two players were forced to do this because if not, they both would have received a loss because that makes complete sense by EA's rules. Beyond just this recent situation, EA's esports scene has been constantly ridiculed and mocked by both players and fans. Besides this rock-paper-scissors headline story, other pro players took to social media calling out EA for their unreliable servers that apparently contributed to unearned defeats. Just over a week ago, one of FIFA's top esports players took a moment in his post-match interview to blast EA's FIFA 20. Tex, that was a thriller, but you got it done. How were you able to keep your edge? Um, every game on FIFA 20 is a 50-50, like, he'll win the next one, I'll win this one, because the game is so, like, unrewarding that anyone can win, like, guys who aren't good can win on FIFA 20, and no one enjoys playing it, but, you know, um, we're here, and I'm in the semi-final now, so, yeah, that's that. Um, I'm quite happy with it, to be honest. Additionally, in the last few weeks, EA has been very publicly feuding with former FIFA pro Kurt0411, who has blasted the company numerous times in the last year, including spitting on the company's logo in a live stream, getting in the face of a competitor while they were doing an interview, and calling out EA community managers and pros on stream. This has led to EA aggressively punishing Kurt. He was banned from EA's esports last year because of his con Conduct, and more recently, he had his EA account banned and is no longer able to stream, it seems, any EA game without receiving a copyright takedown notice from the publisher. EA's explanation for this specific punishment of banning his EA account
account is that he has threatened employees with personal attacks, and while he has been pretty mean, there is no evidence of him threatening, which is why I do find it kind of concerning a massive corporation using this punishment. And I'm not alone with this opinion, as many have rallied behind Kurt calling EA rats for their aggressive actions and not actually listening to feedback. But next we move on to Activision Blizzard losing yet another key developer, this being their co-studio head of Treyarch, Jason Blundell. Widely known for his work on the four Black Ops games, and more specifically the Zombies mode, which he helped create. This departure is rather interesting because of the timing, as Activision last year decided to remove Sledgehammer Games and Raven Software as the lead developers in Call of Duty 2020, and instead pushed Treyarch forward, which has reportedly upset some employees. Call of Duty 2020 has been described as a mess, and based on reports of the development of Black Ops 4, there was chaos going on behind behind the scenes, with certain departments like QA being hit hard with crunch. Now, a studio head leaving months before release is not encouraging news, and it could indicate more problems happening with Black Ops 5's development. Activision is relying more than ever on the success of their Call of Duty franchise. Modern Warfare was a big financial success, but with Black Ops 5, it does seem like this could be the disastrous live service of 2020 based on everything that has been reported thus far. Either way, another Call of Duty game that has been a big financial success is Call of Duty Mobile, which managed to anger fans the other day with the announcement that they would be removing the game Zombie Mode, claiming we wanted to see the reception, see the feedback, and see how we can potentially shape the mode for the future. However, the mode just did not reach the level of quality that we desire, which aka means the mode was not bringing in enough revenue and they felt it was better to just kill it rather than improve on it. 2020 is going to be a very interesting year for this franchise. Somehow for the last two decades, for the most part, Activision has been able to escape any real consequences for their greedy anti-consumer or even anti-employee actions. And I just feel like very soon everything could blow up in their face, Star Wars Battlefront 2 release style. Anyway, to our last topic of the day, we have CD Projekt Red doing yet another pro-consumer action. As we talked about recently, they announced Cyberpunk 2077 would have a free updated version for Xbox One to Xbox Series X players. Basically, you don't have to buy the game twice, a tactic that many publishers last generation exploited to boost revenue. And as we approach the next generation, CD Projekt Red and Xbox are committing to a very pro-consumer stance, which could save players boatloads of money. Well, beyond just this, CD Projekt Red actually made another announcement, this time for their PC game store GOG. We always believed in a gamer's first approach, and with this voluntary update to our refund policy, you can get a full refund up to 30 days after purchasing a product. Even if you downloaded, launched, and played it, this is a huge deal, a policy that is without a doubt the best for players, but many developers are very upset about this, with some even considering boycotting or leaving GOG altogether. The concern is over exploitation, and with many indie games being just a few hours in length, the fear is some could refund after finishing the experience. This is a concern that has been shared widely on social media by game developers, with some claiming that CDPR didn't reach out to developers for their opinion on this. How I see this is that this is a big victory for gamers, but I will say I actually think 30 days is extremely, extremely generous, and I totally can understand why developers, especially indie devs, feel this is maybe too generous. The big question though will be how this policy is implemented and moderated because I could certainly imagine ways that this could be exploited, especially if a game maybe stirs up controversy after release and people retaliate by abusing the refund system. Although in most cases, I don't believe this policy will be that much of a problem, because most players aren't actively looking to abuse refund systems. They'll typically just put their pirate hat on and do it that way, which is much easier on a platform that has the slogan of FDRM. Anyway, I really am looking forward to the next few months of gaming because things are going to start really heating up. Although, as I've learned in recent years, the usual suspects of this industry very likely will do something insanely stupid and it will blow up big time. 
So fun times indeed are ahead, and what game or announcement are you looking forward to the most in 2020? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below, but thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value, and make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos. Links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter, giving opinions on news that I do not always get into video form, so do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games. And again, thank you for joining. Consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.